Be steadfast and movable, always giving yourself to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. To you, dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That text which engages our hearts and our minds this evening is taken from the Gospel of Luke. We hear these words of our Lord. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This is our text. What does it mean to be fit to follow Jesus? Well, there is this bumper sticker I have seen, and maybe you've seen it as well, and I get a little chuckle every time I see a variation of it. It says something to the effect of, do you follow Jesus this closely? Now, I've never been compelled to think about my walk with the Lord in terms of bumper sticker theology, uh, but he makes a good point. What does our walk with our Savior look like these days? How do we, with the best of intentions, follow our Lord or perhaps not follow him? We are indeed sinners who want to do things our own way, who tell God the path we will take to get to the destination. We fail to see Jesus as he truly is. And today in our text, he comes to us and tells us what it means to follow him, to lay it all aside, to obey him at his word, to take him at his word, and to trust him at his word. Maybe your walk with the Lord is as many of our contemporaries, maybe a little bit like this bumper sticker. Maybe the characterization of faith is a little more like this. All ways are valid and lead to the one path. Maybe it doesn't matter what path you take, who you follow, you eventually get there. This coexist bumper sticker maybe sums up the faith of many in our world today. Not just one way, one truth, one life, but one way among many. We know as Christians, Jesus is the only way. Jesus, divine, eternal, sinless, the Son of God who was born of woman, born under law, to redeem us who were under law, teaches us how to follow, how to do so in such a way that goes against all the other world religions out there. His path, his way is better than Darwin, better than Buddha's, better than the religion of self and self-gratification. This Jesus, who is true God, teaches us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. We are not at liberty to create God in our own image. We only follow those things we like and cut out the parts we don't like. No, Jesus teaches us what it's like to follow God wholly and fully. What a great thing. Today, as we look at our text, our text teaches us what it means to follow him. There are a number of things this text teaches us. Number one, the first of is that we are sinners. We think we might be different than those three in our text, telling Jesus what their preferred way of following him is. We, too, prioritize and the bad news is, God isn't always on the top of our priority list. The first commandment, really, the commandment on which all the other commandments hinge, you shall have no other gods, is the commandment we're most likely to break. And when we break this one, we break them all. You shall have no other gods before me. How difficult is it to follow that command? But you are here today because God is God and you are not. But it's hard to follow God when we have places to go, people to see, life to live, college experiences to have. We want to, as our text says, go and bury our father, our mother, take care of those things in our life as priorities, and then if we get around to it, we'll follow the Lord's call. As a pastor, uh, we have these two things called the internal call and the external call. As a pastor, you feel that pull potentially to serve in the ministry, 
prior to being a pastor, that's what's called the internal call. You feel this tugging of the Holy Spirit to lead you into ministry, and as you deliberate and pray on that, you also have what's called the external call, that call outside of yourself from the church, from people around you, from those who know you and think you would be a good candidate for the ministry. Those, those calls come through the Holy Spirit. And as you wrestle with those calls, your mind goes in a thousand different directions. Oh well, yeah, I think I should, but no, I've got all this yet to do. I'll be a second career pastor, God. <laughs> to which he says, oh, really? <laughs> Here you are as a pastor. Here you are in the church. God has a call on your life. We think that God should understand where we're coming from, right? We, God should understand the request to the one man when he says, let me go and bury my father. Come on, Lord, this guy should be able to take care of his family, right? Well, the secret behind this wonderful, pious, good-sounding expression is that the son wanted to attend to his aging father, but it's thought that his father wasn't even dead at that point. Let me go and bury my father. Let my dad get to the point where he eventually dies, and then I'll come after you. So we start to pull back the curtain of what this man's heart looks like. He isn't all in. He wants to wait. He has excuses, as do we all. The prophet Joel tells us, Rend me your heart and not your garments. God wants our hearts to serve him. God wants a heart that is faithfully following after him. Not pious intentions, not Pharisee-type intentions that look good on the outside, but a heart that is pure and fully devoted to him. We, as men and women, look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God knows your heart. God sees into the heart of each and every person. God could see this guy's heart. God knew where this man's heart was. And so Jesus sifts out all the would-be followers. How you think it's easy to follow me? The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but Jesus, I have no place to lay my head. You want to go and bury your father and mother? Let the dead bury their own dead. What does this look like? Well, Jesus basically is saying, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. You come and follow me. You put your trust into my hands, into my promises. What does this look like for us? Well, a practical application would be this. Let the heathen, the unbelievers, let them work on Sunday. Let the dead bury their own dead. You follow me. Perhaps it's your high school grandchild. Perhaps it's your son or daughter that will get a job someday, and the boss is going to say, here you are. You're on the Sunday schedule. Come in. Here you are on the weekend schedule. Work. It's work or else. What are you going to do? How are you going to faithfully follow the Lord in the midst of a culture that pressures you to not follow him? When we lay down our boundaries and say, I shall go this far and no farther, farther, this is following the Lord. Let the heathen work on Sunday. You follow me. What a joy it is for us at St. Paul to have multiple worship opportunities. So may that not be the case for you. But if we think about that, we are not any different than person one, two, or three. We too have desires to do what we want to do. But St. Paul tells us in Galatians 2, verse 20, he says, For I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That is a hard thing, to die to self and to live for Christ, the one who lives inside of us. This is called sanctification, sanctified living when the Holy Spirit is in you. When you live and you follow God because the Holy Spirit works that in you what is pleasing to God. Psalms tells us, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And as you read that word, God lights up the path. 
He gives you the direction to follow. And thanks be to God that the Spirit knows the way. One of the things I often hear as a pastor is, I don't know where God is leading me. I don't know what decision to make in life. I don't know where to go. Well, if you listen to God's word, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, God will guide you. And as Yogi Berra once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. God will be with you. God will guide you. God will lead you as he led his people, as he led Abraham, as he led Moses, as he led David. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 11. These are the heroes of faith, and God led each and every one of them. And what did they have to do? They had to die to self. They had to let go of homelands, places that were familiar to them. Father and mother, they had to let it all go for the sake of following God and his word. And dear friends, that ain't easy. That is not an easy thing, to place your life fully into God's hands, to let the word of God light up your way so that you follow him and you look at life through the lens of God's word. What a wonderful thing. And for us, this means that we get rid of certain things in our life as we follow Christ. We get rid of of the litany list of sins. Paul lays them out. What are they? Here's what Paul says. Sexual immorality, do away with it. Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. Paul doesn't exhaust the list. These are the things that are prominent in his ministry. What are the things prominent for us at St. Paul? What are the things we leave behind as we follow Jesus our Lord? Because of his righteousness to us, we leave the old life, the works of the flesh. We follow the Spirit. We keep in step with the Spirit. We bear fruit Because of the Spirit, as we follow him, here's what the Spirit gives to us. He gives us love. And that love is not an easy thing. But love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. This is a love that comes from your Lord. A love you can give to others in the moment of anger. In a moment of weakness, you can love them. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness. What a wonderful thing. We have self-control. We have all these fruits because our Lord has given us his Holy Spirit, given to us by virtue of our baptism, given to us through the word and the sacrament, given to us through the gift of communion. You have the Holy Spirit, which bears fruit in your life. What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? Well, Our text tells us no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. But Elisha got to say goodbye to his family. Why not the guys in our text? Well, Jesus is single-focused, single-minded. He has a distinct purpose. He's calling his disciples to get behind that purpose. That purpose is to go to the cross, to die, and to rise on the third day. That's his purpose. Nothing will deter him. Nothing will get in his way. Nothing will stop him. And he does it for his church. He does it for you, God's people. He puts his hand to the plow, and he doesn't look back. He doesn't swerve and make furrows that are off-center. He is single-minded in his intentions. May we imitate that. May we follow that example of our Lord Jesus, who with single focus, laser sharp focus, went to the cross. Put his sight on God's plan of salvation for you. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. When I think of plowing, I think of furrows. Maybe some of you have experienced plowing. Maybe some of you have experienced growing up on a farm. But those furrows are deep. Those trenches that the plow makes, 
are for the seed. The seed goes in there, it's going to eventually get tilled under that furrow. And when I think of furrows, I think of Psalm 129, verse 3. It says, The plowmen have plowed my back. They have made their furrows deep. When I think of that psalm, I think of Jesus. When he was whipped and scourged, the plowman plowed his back. The furrows were deep. But he was single focused in, in his attention. He would not be deterred even by plowmen plowing his back. This text reminds me that following Jesus equals furrows. There will be suffering when you follow Jesus. There will be a life of ridicule. There will be intentions of others who finally discover you are a Christian and plow your back. Jesus promises that suffering for the faith will come. But just as Jesus' black back was plowed, so too the fruit was planted and the seed bore a harvest for you. What a wonderful thing that we can follow Christ, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of furrows. There is a promise on the end of it all that our Lord will take us to be with him. Glory not for this life, but in the life to come. God has a place prepared for each one of you. Though for a little while weeping may tarry for the night, joy will come in the morning. God has a place prepared for you because of his work on the cross. May you go forth this day fit to follow him, fit to serve him, fit to put your hand to the plow here in this place and in your community because he has given his life for you. You are his. Now and always may you go forth in that incredible love of your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Amen.